Good morning, everybody. This is, this is exciting stuff. Now, <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. The title of this guy's slide starts with breaking wind. <laughs> How am I going to take this seriously? Are we going to be sitting here for five, ten minutes talking about seagoing flatulence and how it's going to make your life better? Um, the good thing is, no, we're not. What I'd like to talk to you about today is energy, and specifically offshore wind energy and how, that, how that's going to fit into our energy needs in the future. But before I do that, I want to give you oops, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm trained as an engineer, so I think this, this uh, picture here, although I didn't draw it, I think is a pretty accurate representation of how I see myself. <laughs> He's a good-looking guy, isn't he? Um, anyway, I, t I tell you this more as a warning, um, and the warning is I'm sort of a numbers and data geek, and so what you're going to see are some numbers and some data. So if, if you're not e even partially a numbers and data geek, uh, now would be a good time to get some rest before the next speaker comes up. So first, a little bit of context. Where does the world get its energy now? And this is a, this is a chart sort of showing the, the resource for all of our energy needs. This includes electricity, transportation fuels, industrial processes, everything across the whole world. And what you can see here is that we are very heavily dependent on fossil fuels. 81% of our energy globally comes from fossil fuels. And when you think about where we're going with energy in the future, we, uh, we're projecting really pretty significant global energy demand growth. And what you can see here is that's happening outside the U.S. So why is this important? It's important because fossil fuels, they're, they're a finite resource, they're a global commodity, and it's growth outside the U.S. that's going to put upward price pressure on fossil fuels. So for both economic reasons, environmental reasons, a whole bunch of other reasons, we have a pretty serious need to start transitioning to a more sustainable long-term energy future. But you could ask the question, well, do we, do, do we need to really get going on that now? I mean, aren't fossil fuels pretty cheap right now? I mean, we, we use a lot because they're cheap, right? Well, it turns out that fossil fuels are not nearly as cheap as we think they are. And the reason for that is something called externalities. And an externality, a negative externality, essentially is a cost that you incur by using a product that's not, not reflected in the price of that product. So some examples of that as it relates to energy are pollution, uh, public health problems, even to some extent the, the cost of maintaining a military presence in a part of the world that we may not be in if we weren't so interested in the price of oil. And there's a really good example, a really excellent example of externalities that you can point to when you look at coal is a fantastic example of this. Here's what we think coal costs. Uh, the, the two green bars on the left show the, the cost estimate for the, the far left one is advanced coal with carbon capture storage. Sounds fancy. It's basically coal with all the fancy environmental stuff on it. And the, the middle bar is a new coal plant just your basic kind of new coal plant. And just for giggles, I put the third green bar is, let's say it's a 60-year-old coal plant. It's already paid off, costs nothing to run. Just chuck some coal in it, and out comes the energy. It's really cheap. We think it's really cheap. And as a point of comparison, I put the cost of offshore, onshore wind up here. When you add the cost of externalities to coal, this is public health, it's environmental, it's all those costs that are incurred and we pay for as a society, but they don't show up on the electricity bill, you can see that coal is not as cheap as it seems. These numbers come from a study from Harvard Medical School. And uh, they basically, that you, there's a low, mid, and high, and what they said is the mid is, here's what we think it is. But if we overestimate it, here's the low end of that range, and then here's the high end of that range. In any case, even that, even that two cent super old coal plant is not as cheap as you think it is. And I'm here to tell you, this should bother you, and no matter what your political ideology is, this should bother you. If you care chiefly about, you're a pure capitalist, and you care chiefly about free markets and free enterprise, this should bother you because this is a major market failure. And if you're concerned chiefly about birds and bats and the environment, this should bother you because these are costs that are being incurred on those, on those environmental issues that nobody, well, that we're paying for. So this is an industry that has very successfully been able to privatize their profits 
and socialize their costs. This is not a good thing. So, but I'm an optimist, and I, I believe very strongly in the power of markets. And so, I believe that market forces, because of this, and because we're starting to understand this better, market forces are going to be pushing us towards clean energy. And let me tell you, my friends, market forces are very, very hard to resist. That makes me look small in that picture, doesn't it? That guy was big. So let's jump to offshore wind energy and how this, how this fits into the picture. I think whenever you're looking at you know, we don't have any wind, offshore wind energy installed in the U.S. yet. Whenever you're looking at a, a new technology like offshore wind to satisfy energy needs, I think you need to, you need to ask a, a few questions. And the three questions that I would ask are, one, how much is there? How much resource supply is there compared to the demand that we have? Two, will it actually work? And three, what is it going to cost us? So let's, let's take each of these questions. First of all, how much is there? We can talk gigawatts and megawatts, and no, nobody knows what that means. So instead, I'm going to put a bar up. And this bar represents, since we're in North Carolina, let's look at North Carolina. This represents the annual electricity consumption in North Carolina, the height of this bar. And I'm going to put next to this another bar that shows the amount of offshore wind energy that we could get. And so the question is, can we cover 10%, 20% of this bar? with the offshore wind bar? What do you think? All right, well, so for us to look at it, we're going to need to zoom this out a little bit. That's how much offshore wind energy potential there is just off the state of North Carolina. So can we cover 10 to, 10 to 20 percent? I think probably so. So just for grins, let's take the electricity demand for the rest of the East Coast states, from Florida all the way up to Maine, and we'll stack those on top of North Carolina. Can we cover 10 to 20 percent? I think so. Now, to be fair, let's take the offshore wind resource potential for the rest of those states as well. And again, we're going to need to zoom out here. So is there enough? I, th I think there's enough. There's a huge, huge, huge potential out there. So we've answered the first question. Yeah, there's a lot. But all right, we don't have any of these installed yet in the US. Is this really going to work? Well, to answer that, I think we look to Europe. And Europe has a long history in this. First offshore wind turbines installed in Denmark in 1991, and they, they haven't looked back since. Today, there are over 1,500 wind turbines installed in Europe. They have major plans for growth in the future, 43 gigawatts, that's equivalent output of about 20 nuclear plants, just by 2020. And it, Europe is not alone. China, India, Japan, all looking very strongly at offshore wind. Um, China has some installed. Whole new industries have grown up around this, specialized vessels for the installation of this equipment. I mean, as an engineering geek, that thing is pretty cool. Um, and it's already reducing Europe's energy uh, import requirements from places like Russia, reducing their emissions. There's also a ton of stuff to make, so there's a lot of jobs associated with this. And the European Wind Energy Association estimates that Europe will employ 300,000 people in the offshore wind sector by the year, I think it was 2030. So in short, I mean, the answer is yes. Offshore wind works. We've shown that it works. Uh, this is not a technology risk. Um, we haven't done it here, but it absolutely works. So another way that it works, this is a, this is a really cool image from some geeky Na NASA folks that collect data on uh, nighttime light emissions. And what this shows is where is our electricity demand? Really, for the most part, a big chunk of our electricity demand is in coastal, coastal areas. We have high coastal population densities and very high energy demand and energy demand growth in coastal areas. But what you also know about coastal areas is it's pretty hard to find a place, a community that's going to be happy about putting a new coal-fired power plant in their community and building transmission lines all over the place. So you've got these coastal demand centers. And offshore wind offers you the opportunity to put really fairly large clean energy generation and plug it right into coastal demand centers without infringing on, on people's uh, ability to live there. So we've answered the first two questions. There's a lot there. Yes, it works, but what's it going to cost? And admittedly, cost is the biggest challenge. Really, it's honestly, it's perceived cost as we looked at the externalities, but cost is the biggest challenge for something like offshore wind. 
But to put this into perspective, the cost is moving in the right direction. And this, this chart is showing on the far left, the, the, the diamonds on the left are showing cost, cost for signed contracts in the US or very credible cost estimates in the US. Um, you can see that there's a range there. It's a relatively new industry for the US. The D US Department of Energy has cost targets for 2020 and 2030 of 10 cents and 7 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, what the heck does that mean? Um, well, if you think back to that coal chart that I showed, and you will take the, the not fancy coal, the, the new coal, but the cheapest new coal, and we'll take the low externalities, so their lowest estimate for externalities, and that number's right there, and probably going up in the future. So is it cost effective? Uh, in the long run, yeah, I think it is cost effective. The other part, now I'm really gonna geek out on you for a second, is it's more than just the cost, it's also the value of the energy that's delivered. And to illustrate this, I wanna sh walk you through, this curve shows an average daily electricity demand in the summer. So midnight on the far left to, I guess, midnight on the far right, too. And what you can see is, you know, the middle of the night, electricity demand is fairly low. Uh, and it really, it ramps up during the day as it heats up. People turn their air conditioning on, people wake up. And it really peaks out sort of mid, mid to late afternoon and then tails off. And utility companies, you know, they're, they're really focused on keeping our electricity costs as low as possible. So what they do is what's called an economic dispatch, where first they turn on the cheapest thing they can run. And then as demand grows, they turn on the next cheapest thing. And then it grows and the next cheapest thing. And it, when you get to this peak power in the summer, when it's hot and everyone's running their air conditionings, that's when they're running their most expensive plants. So the marginal cost of electricity at peak power is high. So if you can deliver energy during the peak demand period, that's very valuable energy because it allows them to not run those most expensive plants. And what you've, you may have heard about land-based wind is, well, it blows more at night, you know, less during the day, and so da da da. And that's, that's generally true with land-based wind. But when you look at offshore, the, the pattern is different, and the pattern matches very well with this, with this demand. So you get... You get good, what's called peak coincidence. You're delivering energy when it's needed the most, and you're offsetting the cost of some of those most expensive and most inefficient power plants. So we've answered these three questions. There's enormous potential in offshore wind. It's a proven technology, and the costs, while a challenge today, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's a, who's a great American thinker, once wrote that doing well is the result of doing good. And that's what capitalism is all about. And, and I really firmly believe that this, this sort of embodies the opportunity that we have in the transition that we're making from an old fossil fuel environment to a, a cleaner, more sustainable energy future. There's enormous social opportunity for doing good. And there's also enormous business opportunity for, for doing well. And I'm really pleased and excited to be on that journey <laughs> and, uh, and a part of this. And for those of you that are with me on that journey, either in spirit or in practice, I say, welcome to the team. Let's go make our children proud. Thank you very much.